Hello everybody. Hello. So who's here for the first time? Oh very good, very good. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Benoit Glazin and this is my wife's living room. <laughs> this, this is her house. She decides what happens here, but I live here too. 
Um, so we built this place in 2007 because we think that Orlando needs a venue that's small, intimate, quiet, and you know, with good acoustics. And uh, we decided we should build it because it wasn't there. So now, we, now it is, and it's for you and your friends and your family. So uh, take advantage of it. Uh, you guys saw the ads, right? So you saw what's going, what's coming up. Uh, the very next thing uh, that's kind of public is our gala concert. So it's our fundraising event annually. We do that. We're trying to raise a hundred thousand dollars this year. Uh, that's December second, my birthday. That's a that's a more expensive ticket, obviously, because we're trying to raise money. So uh, it's a two hundred fifty dollar ticket. But otherwise, uh, the next few events uh, actually on Wednesday. It's my listening session, that's totally free. We're gonna listen to Bartok Concerto, so you can just come, have a glass of wine, listen to some music for an hour, and then go back home. Mm. And it's gonna be, you know, I use high definition audio, and it's a good system, and I put a, an acoustic room in here, I change the acoustics of the whole place, and it sounds really good. And so it's an experience you cannot have at home, because nobody else has an ACS acoustic control system. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you do, you may, but I don't think so because there's only seven of those in the U.S. and we have one of them. So, um, but you're welcome to come for that. Uh, I hope you come for that, and because I'm going to be there listening anyways, whether you come or not, so you might, you might as well come and enjoy. Uh, then after our public concerts are uh, oh, and very important, the fifth Wednesday of the month is usually Janice Rouse, who does body alignment, voice, and sound. Uh, she works a lot with opera singers and things, but anybody can attend. It's really good. But it will not happen this month because her daughter is having a baby out on the West Coast and so she will be there. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's nothing going to come on, uh, coming up on the last Wednesday of November. She will be back in the new year sometime. Um, then you saw the, uh, the Co uh, Konstantin Kovalev, the sa classical saxophone concert. That's happening on December 9th. He is the most award-winning young saxophone class award saxophone, cl uh, classical saxophonist ever. Uh, like he's won more international competitions than anyone else ever, so that's pretty cool. Uh, including non-saxophone competitions, which is really hard to do. So he's a really good player, so you should try and catch that. And then the 16th of December, we have Conrad Pachkutski and Pasquale Grasso. So Conrad plays piano with Wyn Marsalis and others, of course, and uh, Pasquale is arguably the best jazz guitarist alive on the planet right now. So. You want to catch that one also if you can. Uh, we also have private events, Solaria, the Orlando Sings uh, small group, uh, 25 singers. Uh, they're going to come and sing on December 19th and 21st, but that's not, I, you can't buy tickets on our website. You have to go to Orlando Sings uh, website to get that. But uh, that's that. Now, every month we have a new visual artist, except November, December, we combine those because of the holidays and make it fair for everybody. And uh, of course, this year, all our vi visual artists are young. And it's very, very true of this, this month's visual artist. Her name is Delia Miller. Are you still here? <laughs> she is, she's 20 years old, and she uh, does a lot of murals. So you can see murals of hers uh, around town. And she also paints smaller pieces. These are tiny in comparison. <laughs> Um, but and they're all for sale. The uh, the uh, prices is in the lobby. If you're interested, you can talk to her. She's gonna work live tonight and paint uh, while the poetry is happening. And also, uh, she teaches at Art Reach Orlando. So you, there's literature out there. They teach uh, disadvantaged kids, uh, you know, kids in need, who would not have access to art otherwise. They teach art to these kids. I know that teaching art to kids is very important. We did it with our kids because we were lucky that our second neighbor is an art teacher and she would come here to teach our kids. Um, and so it's, it's if you can, uh, try to promote that and get your kids in your life to uh, attend and to join uh, Art Reach Orlando. So uh, you want to come up? And yes. saw on the slides that uh, the International Chamber Music Festival is happening in uh, January. Uh, there's a lot of great shows happening. Uh, I have a show in there, a concert. It's uh, Sweet for Camille, so it's a concert in honor of my daughter who passed away uh, this past February. And um, I, she played many instruments and well, all of them. 
And so I picked pieces that she liked to play as a child, and I I decomposed and recomposed them. So uh, I played with it, you know, and er the works are going to be played by her teachers on these instruments. So uh, uh, her, her mom is going to play the piano, Hélène. And uh, Mauricio Céspedes, who's the principal viola at OPO, he's going to play viola. And uh, Kathy <coughs> Thomas is going to play horn. Um, and we'll see if they want to play on her instruments or not. We'll see. But uh, it's going to be a good concert. And you have the, the reason I'm talking about this is because it's already half full. And it's happening on January 27th. So if you want, if you're interested in attending, you have to move soon because it's going to sell out very soon. So having said that, uh, it will be live streamed as everything is live streamed. Welcome to the people watching from home. I know there's like 15 people watching right now. So uh, welcome. Yeah, you can say hi to people uh, Cheers. <laughs> Hopefully they're drinking something nice. Um, and that's it. So um, also already up on our uh, website and on uh, Stellar are, is the festival that we call uh, Timucua Amplifies Black Voices that happens in February, uh, 16, 17, 18. Uh, 16, 17, and the 18th, this show is part of that festival. So Authentic Selves is February 18th and it's going to be part of Timucua Amplifies Black Voices. But we have like four or five, four shows on the Saturday. So it's a show Friday night, four shows Saturday, and a show on Sunday. Uh, Sunday. So I hope that you attend that as well. Uh, I have talked long enough, but we uh, are very, very lucky to have so many great writers and artists and musicians in this town. And this is part of why we've built this place, because we want to, you know, invite musicians from all over the world and give a platform. And we try to help uh, artists, local artists, you know, get exposure and get videos of their work and good recordings and all that stuff. So, uh, just a, a slight thing, like obviously, uh, Delia is here, and so you probably don't want to back up too much <coughs> because there will be a collision, mm -hmm. and it might create some unwanted, <laughs> uh, unwanted lines on her on her work. Uh, so you, it, you won't have to. I won't have to force you to uh, to stay in your place. I'm sure you will. Uh, the other thing is, I'm recording using this the flying microphone there. It's a great way to get the real feel of what's happening in the room, but uh, also at the same time we hear everything that you do. So be mindful of that. So uh, you know, you welcome to, you know, during performances, it's probably best not to yell so loud that we're not going to hear anything else but you. So you know, be smart. That's all I want to say. And uh, without further ado, please help me welcome the founder, the host, the organizer, the woman who makes all of it happen, Never mind. He keeps doing that, and I, I keep saying, lower, lower your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> he starts me off really high. Um, so, I think this is probably the biggest crowd we've ever had for this show. Yeah. And and I'm gonna get us started off quickly. Um, this feature artist is uh, very special to me and to those of you who have been coming to this show for a while. I can't see any of you right now because the light is in my face, but I know some of you are here. Um, and so I just want to read one part of his bio. He believes our stories are at risk of erasure and must be written, published, shared, and propagated. Who feels that right now? Ooh. Wait. <laughs> All of our words are a bit in danger. And so this quote from him, story and poetry is the gravity that attracts hearts and minds. Stories inspire, teach, guide, say what must be said. Now more than ever, we must fight to breathe life into the stories we live. And he hadn't even started the poetry yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Collins is our yeah. <laughs>
right, so like Lauren said, story, stories a lot, especially right now because, you know, we got some people trying to erase our story, right? So story, like what is story? What does a story do? Like what does a story do? So for one thing, I can tell you, you know, story tells the truth, right? It gives perspective, right? And it also enlightens people, right? And a lot of times we might think that your story or an individual story is just their story. That's not the case, right? All of our stories are intertwined. Whether you run into a person at a 7-Eleven, you know, you bump into them and say, excuse me, now you guys' stories are connected. If you say hello to somebody, your story is connected. If that's your brother, if it's your sister, if it's your mother, your stories are connected. Now, there's different levels at which a person's story might be impacted by another person, but one way or another, our story is going to impact each other. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share some of my story with the intention of just kind of letting you know, get to know me a little bit, you know, just get to know me. Then also to, I hope, to give you something that you can take with you, provide a perspective that you may not have had before, shift your, your focus on something that you weren't focusing on before, leave you with something special, something, something you can take with you, something positive. All right? Yeah! All right? All right, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to jump into the poetry. I'm going to jump into the poetry, all right? So this first piece is actually about how I began to write poetry. I'll tell you, uh, it was kind of funny. I was like five years old, and uh, my teacher, Miss Kohler, she was like, you know what? I'm going to have these kids write a poetry book. I was five years old in kindergarten. And she had us write this poetry book, and if I, I didn't mention it, but it's actually my birthday tonight, by the way. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> And so, like I said, that was when I was five. I'm, I'm turning 39 tonight. Yeah. Okay, you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it stuck with me. Impact. Everybody has impact. Impact is real. It exists. Use it for good. My teacher, she used it for good, and it stuck with me. You never know how you can impact somebody. Like, like I was saying, our stories are intertwined. You might say hello to that person. You never know what state of mind they're in at that moment. Your impact matters. So this first piece is called My First Poetry Book. Kindergarten. Miss Kohler's class. Homework. Assignment, write a poetry book. Haikus, Diamantes, Sequins, Three Verses Two. Poetry forms I didn't know, poetry, fingers needing me, flower and dough. I didn't know the assignment was me, dough kneaded into a loaf, baked in the oven. I didn't know poetry was also yeast. It's the reason my crust rose like clouds, floating like hopelessness into brighter days. I didn't know the assignment was to be bread rested on a stove top, cooled, then broken and shared like a native tongue. I didn't know. I was in kindergarten, writing poetry in forms I didn't know. Poetry forms, forming me like fingers to a lump of dough, kneaded into a loaf on the stovetop. I didn't know. Writing a poetry book was the assignment, homework, kindergarten, Miss Kohler's class. I was just writing poetry in forms I didn't know. I didn't know the assignment was for poetry to form me. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, impact matters. Impact really matters. This next piece is kind of, it's gonna. So I was born like pretty much a healthy young child, a young baby, but I had narrow ear canals. So I was really susceptible to ear infections and things like that. So I ended up getting a lot of ear infections. And at some point in my, my life, really around the time I started to talk, I went like completely deaf. And it really impacted my uh, speech development. So the reason why I'm telling you that is because my grandmother, um, God rest her soul and thank you for her, you know, thank you so much for her, you know. She decided that, you know what, um, we need to do an experiment, we need to test to see if it's here. And so she just decided that, you know what, we're gonna bang a bunch of pots and pans and make a bunch of noise. And it was crazy, right? Like, that, that's something my grandma would do, something really wacky. 
Um, and she did that. And she found, we found out, or my family found out that uh, I couldn't hear. Now, I say that to say that she was my advocate. She spoke for me, right? So sometimes when, within our lives, you might believe that speaking for somebody else or being like a bullhorn or somebody else's voice doesn't matter, but it does. Like, Tim, like Timoqua is doing for Black History Month. That's a huge thing. Like everything you do, when you speak for somebody, it, it's, it matters. So this piece is really about advocacy. It's, it's in dedication to my grandmother and other people in my life that have like really stood up for me and done so many different things to get me to this point in my life. And for everybody else too. Um, but it's really about advocacy. So. It's called Granny Bangs, Pots and Pans. Granny bangs pots and pans, I don't flinch. My afro is a bronze sunrise, my pamper soggy. Daddy sips Pepsi sitting on a bar stool. Mommy blows kisses. Like baby blue balloons, they float over a rug like a meadow of tulips. Granny bangs pots and pans, I don't flinch. Stumble as I smack lips. Mommy mouths moths, whose wings dust light slivers. Shimmering silence. I chase moss, her voice. I chase moss, her voice. While granny bangs pots and pans, I don't flinch. I cradle mommy's cheek like braille. My eyes stroke her lips, mommy speaks, periwinkle plumes of moss that dance. Granny bangs pots and pans, I don't flinch. Mommy caresses my head, her skin silky as my blanket, I snuggle in my crib, stuffed monkey snug under my armpit. Granny bangs pots and pans, I don't flinch. I'm in a cocoon, in a quiet place. The place, quiet baby, stay quiet and perfect. Granny bangs pots and pans as if hammering my translucent cocoon. In the cocoon, a finger rigid and glued presses a piano key. It rings. Granny bangs, hammering my cocoon, shattering quiet cocooning me, the baby not flinching, like babies flinch when grannies bang pots and pans. Banging pots and pans, they see me, baby not flinching, as granny bangs pots and pans. just tell you the title and I'll explain what the title means and I'll kind of explain what the po poem is about. Um, it's called The Free Lunch Club. So if you don't know, free lunch is what you get if you're unable to afford uh, lunch in public schools, right? Um, but then my public school, you know, you go to the cafeteria, get your lunch or whatever, and uh, there was these people, uh, the cafeteria ladies and the janitors who were always in there, sometimes you have a security guard or whatnot. From my experience, the people, the security guard, the, the lunch ladies, the janitors, um, they were like an additional support system, right? I would always see them like encouraging kids, they encouraged me, talking to me, um, high-fiving me, saying good job on whatever I did. And they did so much that was outside of the job, you know? And they created this environment when kids felt safe, they felt good, you know, kind of like Timoqua, you, you know, <laughs> kind of like Timoqua. Um, when you felt welcome, you can be yourself and, and stuff like that. So um, that's why it's called Free Lunch Club. It was the Free Lunch Club. That was the club. That, it wasn't just kids that wanted free lunch, but it was just anybody that needed somewhere, that needed a space, right? At Richmond Middle, Lunch ladies wear more than hairnets, serve more than food to crowds of rowdy middle schools. This isn't some nine to five, Monday to Friday, off on weekends and holidays. I do these daily duties because other options amount to more lit in my pockets type of gig. Hairnets are crowns. Crowning queens that cater wars through pizza too stale to eat for some. Last sure meal till summer school 
for others. At this cafeteria, queens serve raisin cookies, softening stairs, stoniest calluses on tired hands, a child's hands, callus from hauling bricks to mortar a home. In this cafeteria, queens go as trays like boys in desolate refrigerators. Tater tots and pizzas splattered on this cafeteria floor is a child walking to a home shattered like its backbone. Hollow as space upon sofa has left, thirsting like a cup in a rusting sink under a faucet that hasn't run water for weeks. In this cafeteria, queens are chocolate sweetening milk in cartons, are the cartons closely craving each drop of milk so each drop knows it's worthy of being loved and not just in this cafeteria. In this cafeteria, queens stole like carrots with a pinch of brown sugar sprinkled on top, Scold if a tray isn't in great trash cans. In this cafeteria, the janitors are priests, rolling trash cans like mobile confessionals, collect messes, the muted confessions of barely lived lives, the bell rings. Priests pile weight of silence onto gray rolling carts lining walkways of this cafeteria. These messes do more than build bags. They crack tongues like desert mud, hollow bones of hope like the Mojave sun, the bell rings. From this cafeteria, queens and priests push kids through double doors. Kids leave messes to rot in this cafeteria. Leave messes a child shouldn't carry in this place erected to be left. Leave this cafeteria and go, check, and go chase their smiles. <laughs> yeah, safe spaces, man. Like, it, really, it really matters, you know. Um, I, I can't. I can't tell you like how many people have created safe space for, space for me. Like they're here, and I'm sure they've done it for you guys out there too. So we need more safe spaces. Don't be afraid to get out there and create your own safe spaces. All right. You still with me? All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So we, um, we're gonna get into something that's a little more um heavy. Um, I'll tell you like the first time I ever read this out loud, it brought tears to my eyes. I'll tell you that. Um. But I think I might be able to get through it without a tear. If I don't, hey, you know, I'm gonna get to see me cry. You know, that's all good. <laughs> yep. Um, so this is about my uncle. Uh, he committed suicide. He took his own life some years back. Um, it was real hard for me, my family, and uh, like especially my aunt and his daughter. Uh, but basically, what this poem is about is me grieving. It's me grieving, going through the process of grieving, and through my grieving process, I came to accept his decision. And in some, some way, even though I really can't, I didn't agree with it, you know, regardless, I understood where he was coming from. And I think that, to me, more than anything, like just going through this whole process of writing this is more cathartic. And I don't know if you guys have ever lost anybody. You know, sometimes just expressing that, putting on paper, saying some things that might bring tears to your eyes out loud, it can do a world. It, it can really help you. And then also, too, you know, if you see somebody going through certain things, you might, like, not understand where they're coming from. Hopefully this piece kind of helps you understand where they might be coming from. Support them. Don't rid of people. So that's really what this is about. So it's called Sanctum. I stack bricks around the parking space, staying deeper than the roots of the shepherd's tree. I'll tell you a secret. This parking space isn't a parking space. Bricks aren't bricks. Blisters on palms and fingers bubble up from the bone. This parking space is a sanctuary. Bricks are moments I sift asphalt crumbling into a sinkhole. The gaping gunshot wound he left us. I imagine he pulled the trigger <clears throat> with the finger he used to dial us. It's crazy to assume. Why didn't he call? Why didn't I call him? I stacked bricks and mortared them with silence. I'm good, I promise. In this sanctum, I wall myself. Sweating drops of me into bricks I mortar into sanctum walls. <coughs> Peace out of his car, folded the last of him. Origami he tucked into his chest pocket. The goodbye letter he wrote. It's hard to believe the ink 
inking letters on paper, it's all he had left in him. I can't. He sent a text before he did it. I never asked what it read. If I never know, maybe P wasn't lying in that casket. I stacked bricks and more of them. Blisters bleed hieroglyphs on bricks, old to writings on wall. I didn't cipher and still can't. On Thanksgiving night, we stood beside his new heart, purple and glowing. The moon glowed like a smile, a pearl in the smoky wood grain of night. <clears throat> we planned a trip to Fayetteville, the military museum. P was an Air Force veteran, but he was also lying to us. Pinned places on a map he didn't have and wasn't bombing. I stacked bricks, mortared them into walls around this space, this sanctum. I'm good, I promise. On days off, P did security at Walmart. This sanctum, this space, P parked in. My mom lives across six lanes, the highway. Thanksgiving dinner, our last meal was at her place. I stacked bricks and mortared them. I'm good, I promise. Salt was on his cheeks when they found him. Like salt left after Lake Sursee to deserts. He cried before he pulled the trigger. That's the hardest part. I stacked bricks and mortared them with silence. P wasn't lying about taking that trip to Fayetteville. A lake withered inside him. The, the desert sprawl as water receded. He didn't see over the sand dunes. Rippling rivers running, running on the other side. P walked the desert. Empty water jug and a gun. He saw a savior in dehydration or a bullet. A stack of brick, don't mortar it. I'm like him. Stacking bricks and mortaring in silence. I collapse inside the sanctum's walls, thirsty. P hands me a jug of water. The sanctum walls are crumbling. that somebody else thinks knows it's okay to grieve too. Don't don't feel like you gotta be a tough guy or a tough girl. They always gotta be strong. Just let it out because like my uncle, I think he was always that rock for us and I think that was part of the problem. That he always had to be a rock for somebody else. Alright? So you guys still with me? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. It's my last one. My last one. Um and you know, I, had, I gotta talk about this whole Florida thing. You know what? I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't let this go by without talking about it. Um, right now, we have a governor who's literally trying to erase history. Like, like I was saying, um, there's stories important, right? History is a story, right? And you can't erase some parts of the story. I know there are some ugly parts of the American story, but within the ugly parts, there's gonna be pain, there's gonna be shame, there's gonna be a lot of bad things. But with now all that, you got lessons. And if you erase all that other stuff, you erase the lessons too. So now you can't learn from the mistakes you made in the past. So now you're going to repeat. I'm not for that. It's not. It's mm -mm. It's not. Say it with me. Mm -mm. <laughs> you're not going for it. Nobody's story gets erased. Everybody's story matters. Everybody's. So this piece is called the dry erase board. <laughs> In grade school, I was told that erasing yesterday's notes left open space for tomorrow's lesson. That was a lot. Erasing the dry erase board was like stabbing a syringe. Interstate 95, needle point dripping poison into Miami's Overtown District, the South Hall, withered as asphalt paved through its heart. Asphalt bleached white like a blank dry erase board. Clean dry erase boards are mass graves. Hmm. 
I will never see a teacher erasing a dry erase board the same again in second grade. A boy I won't name was my friend till he called me the N-word. The ER was a thumbtack serrated with the teeth of slave catching dogs stuck in the dry erase board's frame. A reminder of the states that nailed people, Yoruba, Ashanti, tribes people, the dank slave ships that sank into blackness. Tribes turned black under white moonlight, glowing white as a clean dry erase board. I would never see a teacher erasing the dry erase board the same again. In ninth grade, at, in, at Santa's Enchanted Forest, with Zoe and Ebony, my close friends, we laughed, joked as we left, didn't notice police cars until one drove up on the sidewalk. Clutching hosted guns, they demanded ID. I handed student ID, I was 15. Asked what I was doing, just being 15. I faced them. Six hosted but unfastened guns, 15 Grim Reapers loaded in each, one me armed with student ID. Pops pulled up, rescued me. Curfew was my crime, 9 p.m., Saturday. I was 15. That night was my American quinceanero, my rite of passage. The boy dissolved into American villain, like Emmett, like Ernie, like Eric, like Jose, like Trayvon, like the Leaf, like stories not printed, an unmarked gray space in newspapers, blank as clean dry erase boards. I would never see a teacher erasing the dry erase board the same again. College, the apartment, knock at the door. I typed stories that rained over white space, letters on pages, keyboard clocking. It's the only noise I've made for hours. Police didn't say hello, barged in saying noise complaint, clutching holes of guns again, again asked what I was doing. They searched silence for the perfect place to find probable cause. Thank God they didn't plant it. A seed bearing rotten fruit that tastes bitter as a checkbox, yes for convicted felon, or a life box and buried in the coffin. They burned and lynched for less, mailed, muti mailed mutilated bodies, muti mutilated corpses on postcards, pocketed charred body parts as souvenirs. Many dead are blank spaces, like blank spaces lynched in King Gonzalez Day pieces. I would never see a teacher erasing the dry erase board the same again. They've been paving since Wall Street was made with cobblestone. Asphalt paved, entombed the first stocks traded, people paved over, erased, and the asphalt abysses of unmarked graves. Their bones still pillars to pavement, the bedrock to this nation, but still erased. Erased, kaleidoscopes, people, libraries, erased, Neighborhoods erased, tribes erased, blood painting, the flag's red stripes erased, erased, the poem I just read erased, erased, erased. I would never see a teacher erasing the dry erase board the same again. I would never, never, ever let myself be erased again. So this is like a big moment for me, and it's also my birthday. So. <laughs> what a way to celebrate! What a way to celebrate! Um, but again, man, just write your stories, put them out there. They, they matter. Like I don't care which way you do it. If you're just telling it, whatever, just put them out there. They matter. Stories matter. Um, I'll go ahead and plug myself real quick. Uh, you can follow me at, at TC the Grio. Um, that's TC the Grio G R I O T. A lot of you already know, so you, you don't need to worry about all that. Y'all see me here. <laughs> um, now, thank you guys. I really thank you. I thank you for all the love, all the support. Uh, people watching, I love y'all too. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, everybody.
more round of applause and a happy birthday. Yeah. I didn't know it was Anthony's birthday until mm. about a week ago, and I was like, and you're spending it with us? Mm. I was really excited about that, very privileged that you love this place so much that you are spending a special day with us, and there's cake. Um, which you can't have till later, but there's cake. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple things I want to I want to say. Um, anybody who's been here before knows that I like to talk about mental health. I've had my own struggles with it, and I've seen Anthony get more open about mental health as uh, he's been reading here, and I, I appreciate that. I told my cousin today. She's she's sitting back there somewhere. Um, hug somebody. If they'll let you hug them, you know, you just gotta know who you are, but kindness is rare these days, and you have no idea what a person is going through and how that moment might change or save them. So give kindness, give hugs, or give whatever your way is. Um, second, I, um, I have said this before, I've gotten to watch you grow. Anthony's uh, first started coming last August. So he's been coming to Timaqua for over a year. And you know, if he couldn't come, I got an Instagram message just like, Lauren, I can't make it tonight. And he'd be bummed. He'd be like so upset. Like, I can't make He's like, yeah, I gotta go to the airport. I gotta pick up my wife. Like, <laughs> couldn't get a babysitter. You know, I gotta be here with these kids. Like, he'd be upset <laughs> if he couldn't get here. And um, I know Petra, like, I am grateful for you to letting him be here all the time. I know you're very proud and me personally watching you grow over this year, like you're a different person than when you first started coming here. I know you started talking about, you know, your legs shaking and whatnot, but even what you read tonight, the way that you are weaving your words and being transparent is so, you have grown so much and I am very privileged to see that and see you on the stage. So thank you, thank you again for coming to me a couple months ago and saying, all right, Lauren, I'm ready. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're gonna start the open mic portion of our show. Before that, Delia, can you tell us what you're doing back here? I am painting and <laughs> I'm just, I have the idea of this dove right here and I'm adding and painting things as I go and how I feel and so, I don't know what it's going to look like at the end of the night, and you guys will find out soon. <laughs> That's how art is, right? Just letting yourself out and just seeing what happens. So, we do have a lot of participants tonight, so for those of you participating in the open mic, remember you got your, uh, your X right here. That's so we can see you. That's so everybody that is online can see you. You have five minutes, say it with me. Five, five minutes. minutes. And what does anybody know here about that five minutes? I'm not counting, because I'm listening. So please, on our system, try not to go too long. Try not to go more than five minutes so Benoit doesn't kill me and kick me out later. And uh, we will, uh, if there's anybody who signed up online for the open mic and has not talked to me yet, please come and see me so that I can make sure that I have you on the list. And we are going to start with Kay because she keeps getting here first. And I told her she keeps getting here first, she's gonna keep going first. And then we'll have, um, oh, I'm gonna pronounce her name wrong. Tiffany? It's, I'm gonna do it later. And Grace, I'm gonna say it when I get back to her. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Piece, but I'm going to share it with you. 
image of you, image of me, image of what I thought we could be. As I sit here processing these thoughts of our broken relationship, all these thoughts so deeply rattling in my brain, ain't it funny how fast things can change? One day you were my obsession, the next day my kryptonite. Like a light switch, our vibe seemed to change. The feeling began to fade. I look back on how the image of you, the image of me, the image of what I thought we could be, realizing I was really in love with the life you could have given me, you and your two boys, who made my soul and heart fall so deep, from my inner soul that was so loud and barren, not ever knowing that I would ever feel the joy and the love only a mother could feel. I always left it unspoken so that others would not see me as broken. It was the image of the possibilities that could come from the image that was in my mind. I thought this the whole time that one day I could be where my heart would be and my head would lie, or day do I speak. At the end of the day, that was the image that I seeked, and yet you had no intention of letting me keep. Image of you, image of me, image of the deep message I was supposed to see, that a mother is something that I am supposed to be, which is why I'm gonna adopt soon, so thank you. <laughs> together is I'm talking about my two best friends so that lights in my eyes oh, yeah. but yeah <laughs> so um, yeah she sits in the kitchen beside a pot of dying flowers each petal fell so close to the vase but did not dare to venture off the counter her eyes fell closed almost for too long tears that could have been used to water the flowers fell from her hazel eyes they were not big enough and not in time to save the already dead flowers if only I cried sooner, if only I could make my tears larger, maybe I could have been enough to save them. The life inside of them is gone, and it's all my fault. The flowers of my soul have wilted, and no one was there to water them. Only I could have done that, but someone else, someone else's garden took precedent. The only difference between these flowers and her is that the dark purple petals do not resemble the, the decaying bread that her spirit now obtains. Once what burns so bright in the pit of her chest is a dying candle in the honeymoon suite of a couple that never made it to the wedding. She pinched a petal with her fingers and felt her heart crumble with falling pieces. She let go and let everything in her body settle to the bottom of her soul as it was pulled down, almost as, almost as if to give it a running head start into Nirvana. The world felt this feeling too, a numb sadness that nobody completely understands how to navigate, a sadness that only knows how to settle, only knows to be completely silent. That's the grief going out into the world. Pure silence, a gunshot, a deafening aura of being uncomfortable yet settled. This is a familiar feeling to the world, even if it isn't to me. The world knows this feeling, it will help me. This land has been in this place before and now it shows me how to be here. There are no words to describe silence. The pain of a kidney stone, the pain of love, where are the words? What do I use to describe it? I need to make you understand what I have gone through in life without telling you what I've gone through. I need you to feel the emotions that a higher being allowed me to feel for so long. Maybe I'll show you my emotions. Can you hear the pain? Can you hear how, bad, how badly Kenny Stone and love hurts? You understand. Now I hear a man whisper, whisper to me, get loud if you have to, baby. I stop. Did he, say, did he just say that to me? Did he comfort me? A man? This man? Why now? Now I'm angry. I no, longer, I no longer feel a settled, uneasy sadness. I felt anger. I know how to navigate anger. The man who just looked in my weeping eyes and comforted me, he is the one who taught me how to navigate anchor. I navigate my fist into a child's ribs, giving her the feeling of not deserving air. The palm of my hand into her face, knocking self-doubt in her head. A push on the shoulders that sends his little glasses flying off his face. Tears stream down them. I stop. 
I love them. How can I do this? Did someone else hurt them? Get loud if you have to, baby. Just shut up. I don't need you. Mm. But I'm allowed to get loud now. I can if I need to. I'm allowed to tell everyone that walks all over me that they are not worth more than kindling the fire that's starting to grow again. It burns so bright that the dead flowers catch on fire and burn down the whole damn house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving the man power again, power over me to be hurt by him, because what if he doesn't cover me next time? I'm an adult now, not a scared child holding on to someone whose, someone whose love could be compared to an explosion in a faraway country set off by an American soldier. Now he's saying I'm allowed to get loud so people don't treat me how he treated me? How is that not supposed to mess with my head? Why did I need him to tell me that? The second man in my life greatly resembles the first in his words, you're going to be so happy without me. I need them both to stop. Please stop. I'm finally strong enough to break away and you're giving me permission. Is this your last punch to my ribs before I'm, not, before I'm strong enough to not have to hit you back? Wait, did he see? Did even he see how my growth was stunted? Did even he see my potential yet decide to stay? He fed off my dying light, used my burning soul and fallen tears to grow his flowers. I was wrong. I did not willingly choose his garden over mine. He stole my resources and told me I did not have any. He swam in the hurricane that drowned me. How evil could somebody possibly be? The flowers in the meadow of my mind have grown wildly out of control since he's been gone. I will spend no more time writing about someone who knew my potential and decided to watch it die with a front row seat and to be so unbothered that popcorn crunched between his yellow teeth. This world is so beautiful. Its smile, its lights, its ability to be so alive to always have someone wait something waiting on you. My mother smiled at me with an aura that wears yellow much better than he does. So I left, and I took some of his petals with me to bury them under my soil when no one would hear their screams. No matter how many times he puts on that mask, there is no longer a version of me that exists for him. So now I sit in the car, Sam is sitting beside me. I'm so high that I don't remember where we parked. Why are you always high? If you have a drinking problem, shut up, just let me go. Sam and I's spirits are familiar with each other in ways that our bodies are not. We know each other deeper than we think we do, and that's why we can never separate. This friendship will be part of my lives. When I reach Nirvana, or the few spirit that Sam possesses does, the other will be lost, not sure what to do with themselves. It will not be true Nirvana till the other arrives. They held on to the rake and watering can I needed until I was strong enough to hold my tools again. And now my high slips into another world where Sam and I are happy hippies dancing in the clear waters of a spring, only being haunted by the dark shadow of dying in the back of rusty old vans. Telling ourselves it's okay, I'll amount to something in my next life. The dirty needle that sends my soul into a universe where it moves through smooth waters with no definite shape enters my arm. It smiles up at me. I opened my eyes from a dream that God's hand was in mine. We were walking to an abyss of dread. I can't see the dream or remember it really, but I swear I can smell his breath as he whispered in my ear. I blinked and missed your entire existence. being on stage performing my poetry. <laughs> and it was such a wonderful experience and I want to thank the Macaw Arts and my friends for supporting. And I have another one to share. Um, this one I wrote for a friend of mine who is currently incarcerated and struggling with a drug addiction. And I care for him deeply. And I shared this with him today. And um, he was really touched by it. And I hope you guys will be too. Okay. Best friends. I'm his best friend and he is mine. We've been there for each other through the best and worst of times. He's been there through it all. Hasn't walked away. He loves me for who I am and I can say the same. I want the very best for him. His dog dude, daughter Aubrey, and his wife by his side. The simple life. A good kind woman to give him what he needs and more. Love, affection, someone to adore, a normal life, a career, and parents who are proud of him. That's what I always pray for. I hope he can slay the pesky demons that won't go away. Hope he takes the help that's out there, casts aside the shame. Get clean, start over, and be forever changed. Lean on God when staying sober is rough. Live the straight and narrow even if it's tough. I pray he changes so he'll be around until we're old and gray. I hope our friendship will remain and always stay the same. Oh. Y'all are deep. 
tonight. Uh, I always love when we have first timers and that are willing to be vulnerable in this space and people that are coming for the first time and coming to grow in this space. That's uh, it's always my favorite. So thank you for sharing your stories with us. Um, I brought the paper this time, so I don't butcher any names. Uh, next will be Curtis. You don't get to go last today, okay? Uh, and then Doug, and then Peter. Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy birthday, Anthony. Uh, this is the part where I usually tell you that the after party is at uh, IHOP. But I drove by and the lights were off. So I don't know where the after party is going to be, but you're all invited. Um, part of that after party, we usually have a parking lot cipher where we do a bunch of poems we didn't get to do, etc., etc. I'm going to do a poem about my grandma there because I it's a super personal one so I'm gonna do a different one that I've been practicing and yeah if I can remember it for my grandmother this is a different grandmother poem but for my grandmother Sylvia Mae Brown for Chris Burkhoff and most of all for the residents of Winter Park Towers, where I worked from 2003 until 2005. Old Bat. Mostly I reside inside the darkness of my own cave. This room is decorated with photos of my family. My grandchildren visit me on occasion Gather around my bed as curious explorers. Their stares pierce me as high beams the jaws of a laughing entrance. A mouthful of stalactites and stalagmites, the lights. <coughs> they burn my eyes. I hear clicks and screeches of all the other old bats cry out from beds for nurses. For husbands and wives long gone, I was meant to fly. I rise out of bed and stumble. Claws formed on thumbs fumble, awkwardly trying to grasp my walker. You could say I'm clumsy on land. Eyesight's not what it used to be. Ears hear just fine. My ears are satellite dishes bouncing feedback off the walls of these hallways, taking in all manner of subsonic conversations as sound waves have evolved sonar to help me navigate the labyrinth they call me bloodsucker. Say I'm diseased. Say keeping me alive keeps bleeding my family dry financially. They threw me in here like I didn't deserve day, like, 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 vermin stuck in the attic. I'm no buck tooth rodent. I was meant to fly. My gown falls past arms like elegant webbing. An extra layer of skin. The cloak of a ghostly angel. Now all I do is crawl. Wallow amongst the smell of halls. The stench of death permeating as the pollen from pink flower patterns on moldy wallpaper. There are no flowers inside a cave. Only fungi and lichen. We leave our roosts to feast in nature's dining room. The bedridden serviced by the staff of insects, I tiptoe past piles of filth that litter the cavern floor, waiting to be picked up the elevator are big enough to be hold stretchers or mine carts. They serve as gateway to the vast network, the empire of tunnels that never seems to end. Eyesight's not what it used to be. Memory could be better. My nostrils pick up the scent of pink death in full bloom at night. The moon has my husband's face. The sky extends a hand, invites me to dance amongst choirs of fireflies, longing to Kiss my chin's whiskers, I sneak out. Sometimes I'm no more than a flicker across the ceiling. <laughs> Something the nurse on night shift swears she saw out of the corner of her eye. 
Other times I'm a living cape, a nocturnal phoenix, a spectacular banshee built to smoke, a glorious butterfly made of shadows. Sometimes I open up my window. Other times I take the elevator down to the shore of the lake out back. I leave my walker on the dock or at my windowsill so I can circle the lake as many times as I like before sunrise. I open arms wide to catch sky between my fingers, my mouth so as to ingest clouds. There are no walls for sounds to bounce off of above my cave. The world is freedom. The cosmos becomes a gigantic ballroom. I am dancing with my husband, the other old bats. The retirement home staff all shrink from view. I am untouchable until dawn arrives. When it does, I land. Full fans of potential beneath my armpits. I go back to perching atop my walker. I re-enter my room, my cave. Once again, surrendering youth, surrendering freedom, surrendering Memory, slip back into bed, wait for nurses knocking to make the call for breakfast. I may crawl around inch by inch this place. It keeps me grounded. But they'll, they'll never take my wingspan. Yeah! I gotta follow that. Yeah. You couldn't have had him go less. I'm sorry, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> On this week of Thanksgiving, I am so grateful to be here. I travel for a living, so I'm rarely home on Sundays. And so this is a real treat for me. I'm very grateful to Lauren and to Benoit and to Mukwa and to you, so thank you. That being said, it's been a tough week. I just lost two of my best friends. No, no, they're still alive. I, they just don't want to be associated with me anymore. <laughs> I, I probably should have started that differently. Yeah, two of my best friends on the planet told me that doing their favorite activities is less fun with me than without. <laughs> and they would no longer be inviting me to join them on such outings. To say I was devastated would be an understatement. <laughs> At first reading, I wouldn't blame you for thinking Doug must be an asshole. <laughs> and I'm not saying you'd be wrong for your initial <laughs> assessment. I'm not saying you'd be right either. That's for you to decide. I won't argue I'm not the easiest person to be around, but I'm not the most difficult either. I have my quirks for sure, but no more than anybody else. It's just that these people have been two of my closest friends, my chosen family, my tribe. And all of a sudden they seem to walk over to the Lifetime Connection outlet and pull the plug. <laughs> these two friends are a husband and wife team, and I'll mainly be speaking about Angelo since he is the one that seems to have the most conflict with me. Keep in mind, a large majority of the time, we're able to relax and have a blast together. It's just that the clashes stir up so much emotion, defensiveness, and frustration that it sometimes makes the relationship feel like a lot of work. Have you ever had a friend like that? Mm -hmm. I'm the introspective artist, magically creative yet melancholically brooding. Angelo is the extrovert entertainer, a funny showman, yet he only has two speeds, full blast or dead. <laughs> Angelo's wife, Lisa, is the caretaker, always serving others, yet often laughing, self-care, and avoids confrontation at all costs. Recently, we have gone to the theater, a production that they loved and I thought was average, gone to one of their favorite restaurants, which they thought was over the top, and I thought was, well, average, and watched a movie together, which they thought was a 10, and I thought was a 5, or shall we say, average. average. Yes, I have high standards, although most often my highest standards are reserved for the guy in my own head. Anyway, if you haven't guessed already, these are three of the activities they will no longer be inviting me to, to share with them. I actually received a phone call to tell me just that. We will no longer be inviting you to the theater 
any of our favorite restaurants or watch with you or even recommend to you any of our favorite movies. I was stunned. Who says that? And a wave of sadness the size of a tsunami crashed over me that resembled my heart being fed into a shredder. I'll skip most of the conversation for brevity's sake, but the gist was that they don't want to be around me when I don't feel and express the same level of exuberance that they do when it comes to their most beloved activities. I was informed that they'll be happy to invite me to events that they feel are not as exciting or don't require any interpersonal depth. <laughs> and they'll certainly join me on some of my outings. I just won't get to share their favorites with them anymore. More shredding. Here's the kicker. At all three events, I had a fabulous time. But Doug, you might ask, you just said all three were average. How can that be fabulous? Good question. And I have a simple answer. I have always leaned toward the adage, it's not what you do, it's who you do it with. Yeah. That's it. Short and simple. During all three events, I was loving being with them. And even though I wasn't thrilled with the specific performance, meal, or movie, I was giddy to not only share time and space with them, but to experience their joy as they felt it in the moment. Talk about a turn on. That's what I want for all of my friends. Hell, that's what I want for everybody. If I and the folks I don't have good relations with had more experiences like that, there's a good chance we would be friends. The phone call had a fair amount of non-understanding since Angelo couldn't comprehend why I would watch more than 15 minutes of a movie that I considered average. I have plenty of reasons. I wanted to experience what brings them so much joy. I wanted to experience them having that joy. And most selfishly, I wanted to steal as much time as I could just being around them. Angelo admitted we were simply different that way. Shred. Of course, I admit there is the exuberance portion of the puzzle. It feels fantastic when you and those around you all feel the same excitement and buzz at the same time. It's magical. It's intoxicating. I know. I've been to enough sporting events and concerts to feel what it's like to share exhilaration with 80,000 other people. <laughs> but is that experience so important that you'd sacrifice connection with a friend, a family member, or a loved one? Aren't there enough times when those loved ones aren't around and you get to experience that giddiness just the way you like anyway? Don't we have enough time away from others that we'd want to soak up whatever time we could with those we love? Especially our inner tribe. I do. I'll feel better. It'll get easier, I know. I'm just being swallowed by sadness at the moment. But... While I'm here, let me implore to you to consider that adage, it's not what you do, it's who you do it with. Again, there will be times when you'll share activities with only those who express the same level of excitement as you. But when you have the opportunity to be with those you love, do so. We've only got so much time to share, and before you know it, it'll be gone, or they'll be gone. Now, I don't know how I'm supposed to act during which activities. What if a new event becomes one of their favorites? What if a nice event becomes exhilarating? Will that be posted on the No Doug list? <laughs> and how will I even know in the moment if I'm meeting the standard or not? Can I continue to enjoy some of these activities with them if I express the right level of excitement? What level is that? Am I a good enough actor to pull that off? If they find out I'm faking it just to have more time with them, will they become angry and write me off forever? I don't know. I suppose time will tell. In the interim, I'll continue to live by another popular adage, one day at a time. In the brilliant words of the Shawshank Redemption's Ellis Redding, I guess I just miss my friends. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah. Woo. Yeah.
Great to see so many folks here. I'm Peter Gordon. I'm going to read a couple of short poems. Before I start, though, I also want to just say I was here when Anthony did that reading that Lauren talked about, his very first one, and I, too, am just so, so thrilled to see his growth and so glad I could be here for his feature and his birthday. Thank so, you. great job. Yeah. And I was very glad to see that we had folks from the Orange County Library here yeah. before we came in because it was such a great segue into this first short poem I want to read you. Libraries all over the country have been doing <laughs> banned book displays and banned book festivals. Woo! Yeah. And I think that's great. And I wrote a short poem called Banned Book Festivals. Those who'd rather ban than read are right to fear an idea's power. Every book, an armed bomb waiting to explode old modes of thought. Yes! Thank you. Uh, it's Anthony's birthday, and I think that's great. I'm a few birthdays ahead of him. <laughs> and when you get to my age, well, uh, this poem is called Scars. <laughs> Older I get, the more I accumulate. This latest diagonal slash across right chest marks the former location of a benign cyst. Wide T-shaped one above my waist shows where Dr. Mancuso cut out cancer. Scimitar shape on right toe, souvenir from agonizing bunionectomy. <laughs> Others, reminders of past encounters with power tools or IVs, all trophies from my fight to stay alive. Plenty of room for more marks in my future for knee or hip replacements, heart bypass, transplants. No DNR for me. I fight until my end, like Alexander the Great, who led his Macedonian army from the first line, proudly proclaimed no part of his body, in front at least, remained scarless when my dermatologist offered silicone strips to help scars fade faster. I refused. Thousands of years in the future, when archaeologists return to Earth to find humanity's misty origins. Difference between that time and today will make years between Alexander's era and ours insignificant. They'll find my headstone, dig up dry bones, examine scars with advanced science, and conclude this one must have been a great warrior. Oh. <laughs> poems tonight, and even if you don't, I'd love to see you all, well, at the other open mics, of course, the other uh, poems, but in March, on the third Sunday, I am going to be the feature poet, so I hope you'll all come. of this show, which I didn't think we would get to ever. Um, I, I want to go back to Doug's story um, for a second, and I apologize to anybody in here that is an extrovert, but do you ever just enjoy anything quietly? <laughs> and somebody's like, oh, smile, it's not that bad. I'm like, I was having a good day until you spoke to yeah. me. <laughs> Everyone's like, well, you don't like my friends and you're so quiet. And I'm like, I'm, I'm okay. What's wrong with you? And, you know, you just need, well, you need to get over it. I'm like, well, I, I can't. I am notorious for showing up and sneaking out and my brain's like, we've done enough. <laughs> so I appreciate that story because I've, I've had similar experiences with people that 
just couldn't accept it. You know, sometimes we like to be quiet. Uh, moving on, our next three will be Claver, Simron, and Christian. Imagine sport. That's why I took up running in the first place. No partner needed. Could be done alone. Racquetball exhilarates. But no one can play by himself and milk that manic pace. Swimming laps as fun cannot compete with frisbee. But a tree cannot toss back. No will seashores, well muscled waves heave back volleyballs. So I took Nike feet and speedo girded loins. <laughs> Imagine sport as love. What can a person do to assuage a heart courtless, buddyless, touchless? Contort. Affection begs two, need but one to spew rage. Elder brother, nailed that elder brother. Kid thrust home, an oozing alienation opened, sputters at the father, robeless now it seems. Certain curtain flesh is rended, younger feasted, friended, slipping ring to mended finger. Swinger home at last, prodigals hanging past, Yet Elder hangs abandoned, though forever always his. And thought of augured second covering, cloak of scars, signet resurrection, fusing Mars, word promise, flirt returning fruitless to their poet, in such abyss, all tentative intent, as Elder loyal brother there, bleating his complaint, Not my. Hyssop delivers the spots, the stain, shirt and skin drenched red. And by this mess, the master showers his bullish dead ahead. Substitutionary questioning, now broken, brought by bow. My place is taken, sins in part to beasts on beckoning brow. My shirt, my skin. I bleed, yet not my blood. His sup proffers the grape, the grain. Hands and heart rest red. And through this thresh, the victim press earth's sole ingredient. Eucharistically swallowing, no token, bought, what price? My being is bitten, nor can boast of smitten rank, save one. My hands, my heart, I flux, yet not my flood. Rich sap rivers through grape, through uh, rich sap rivers. Oh, I'm sorry. Rich sap rivers. Get the next few words. Go to the last line in your poem in your head and work out. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you got it. R rich sap rivers through root through stem. Bulb and bud leap green. And with some switch miraculous, ray spawns to vitamin. Capillary nourishing as soaking branches trace. Face branch on branch of flourishing, transmit a hands-on grace. My lease, my luck, 
I bloom, yet not my bud. today is how important it is to tell stories in the face of erasure and um, I'm so glad that you said that because a huge part of um, the meaning that I get from this poem um, is exactly that. Um, this poem is also really really special to me because the person who inspired this poem is in the audience today and what a privilege it is. To yeah. This is titled Tiger's Tooth. In 80 years, there will be a story that my grandkids will tell about their grandparent, and the story will have two versions. Let me explain. At dotted lines between India and Pakistan, there was a war that spoke in puddles of red that reflected an image of a girl. You see, in the middle of war lived a girl who saw her reflection the clearest after curfew. The guards at the refugee camp warned her of what happens to girls after curfew, but the girl knew that that didn't apply to her. It wasn't that she wasn't afraid of death. She was. She was just more afraid of waking up to another day of drawing blackened curtains that descend from cumulonimbus war clouds. So she planned her escape. Two miles south of the camp was a canal. The canal could be a way out. The girl had never been to the canal. In fact, most people at the camp never dared to venture in that direction. You see, there were stories about this canal, and in these stories, the canal was a death wish. In these stories, the canal was surrounded by dangerous, blood-sucking tigers that would spit you out <coughs> before you even thought in freedom. But when the girl's world vibrated under 3 a.m. earthquakes, 4 a.m. constellations drew her a map to the canal. The next day, journalists wrote a headline that read, Girl Dead, Eaten by Tigers. <laughs> but the thing about this version of the story, the version not told by the girl, is that it ends here. It ends with death. But the truth is, in the true version of this story, the story goes on. In the true version of this story, it's not that the girl doesn't die. She does. But she also lives long enough to tell her grandkids about it. And isn't that the interesting thing about resurrection? That resurrection isn't about evading death, but about dying and still holding enough power in your palms to live again, about claiming enough agency in your story to make sure that the version of it that is the truth lives in your grandkids. So I want to tell you a version of this story that includes the full truth. You see, I lived on dotted lines and saw a reflection of a girl, a girl that wasn't me in puddles of red. I decided I didn't want to swim in red the second I heard there was a canal of shimmering blue. And I knew what people said about the, the canal, uh, about the tigers. But I also knew it was the same thing they said about people like me. And it was interesting how I could find and replace words in their story, and I could see that queer was replaced with dangerous, that trans with death, and I thought, how can I wake up and live when they've already dug me a grave? So I went to the canal, <clears throat> and I smiled when I saw the tigers, <clears throat> and I lived again. And the next day, I wrote a headline that read, the tiger lives and they are formidable. <laughs> <laughs> So 
about two months ago, I started to read pieces of my memoir before I was requested <laughs> to write something for last month. <laughs> but um, I'd like to get back to the memoir. Um, I'm just thinking, the reason that, I, I get this question a lot, right? I get, you're young, why are you writing a memoir? And um, it has to do with what Anthony and what Simran just read about is, I needed to remember this story the way that I experienced it. Mm -hmm. Because I lived for, like, I. it happened almost 10 years ago now, but, I lived like eight years pretending it didn't happen at all. So, yeah. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, if you remember last time, um, I read about this young girl and she went home with some other guy at the end of a party. Um, so we're gonna keep talking about her. So, okay, so short synopsis. <laughs> Short, short synopsis. Short synopsis. After that happened, I said, I texted her. I said, I can't keep talking to you because it's bad for my mental health, so I'm going to cut all ties with you. And she was like, that sucks. And I said, that sucks in my head. And then I had one of the worst weeks of my life. It actually, I think, was probably a worse idea. Um, I, um, I was at the University of Iowa at the time. I almost got kicked out of school. Um, I just, we'll, we'll skip over those details, but <laughs> at the end of that week, I decided, okay, I, I logic to myself. Okay, with her was not really working, but without her is, we're somehow working even worse. So I guess there's no real harm in continuing to talk to her. So I texted her again and I said, hey, I changed my mind. Um, <laughs> that was a bad idea. And she was like, oh, okay. And then like we met for tea or something like that. Um, so what I'm gonna read from now is after that, she asked me, my mom is coming into town. Do you wanna come watch a movie with us? And I was like, sure. And we watched Frozen, which was new at the time. Mm -hmm. And we were like, me and her were like, well, sorry. Her mom was like, that was the best movie ever. And then me and her were like, yeah, it was good. Um, anyway, she drove me home after, and that's what I'm gonna read. <clears throat> so what did you think? About the movie or your mother? <laughs> Either. I mean, they were both nice, pleasant enough. But it felt to me like there's something off about the way you interact with her. Like you're angry at her or something. I know you said she was annoying, but this feels like something else. <clears throat> she took a drag on her cigarette before she exhaled and tapped the end of it out her window. We were stopped at a light and she fiddled with her iPhone and music started to play over her car speakers. Her car's dashboard showed the album art, the top of a woman's head through a form tight cutout at the bottom of a wall mirror. I recognized it. The National. Yeah, it's their latest, Trouble Will Find Me. Have you heard it? No, I mainly know Alligator and Boxer. The last one I heard from them was High Violet. This one's good too. We didn't talk anymore the rest of the drive, we just listened to the album. She pulled into one of my apartment's empty guest faces and we just sat there listening to it. I looked at her, but she was turned facing away from me with her arm and cigarette hanging out her window. When she finished smoking, she threw it on the ground outside, opened the door, and crushed it underneath her foot before she closed the door and window back up. She turned the volume knob down all the way to zero and faced back toward me. Do you still have feelings for me? I was startled by her question, but after a moment of hesitation, I answered. I mean, yes? But that's crazy. Isn't that bad? Doesn't that hurt you? I guess, kinda. But it's better than not talking to you or being your friend at all, so I'm okay with it. As long as it doesn't bother you. Her eyes widened as she turned to face me more directly. She looked me straight in the eyes and I looked back at her. 
Then she sat back in her chair and looked out the front windshield. You know that guy I told you I went on a date with before? Monty? Yeah. We talked for a little bit, but then things kind of fizzled out. But then he sent me this letter and he, to and he told me all these weird things. She read me the letter, but all that I remember is the relevant detail. At some point, he admitted to her that he thought about her when he masturbated. Jesus. I was caught off guard and let out a short, nervous <laughs> chuckle. She pulled her hat down over her face and whined at me. Stop! It's not funny! I know. I'm sorry. I'm not laughing because it's funny. It's just... I sighed. It's kind of awkward and gross. Yes. I know! Who does that? Well, obviously Monty. <laughs> she groaned and her entire face disappeared into her hat. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll stop. She pulled her face back out from under her hat and looked at me. Just never do anything like this to me, okay? Well, you don't have to worry about that. I don't masturbate. <laughs> really? I looked back at her and thought about the truth before I continued. <laughs> Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm not lying. Hold with me. Alright. I mean, I have before, but it wasn't exactly for that purpose. What do you mean? Well, when I was with my ex, she asked me to masturbate for her in a Skype call once, but then she wouldn't do the same for me, and I always felt really weird about it after, and I never did it again. And then, you know how I medically withdrew last semester, right? Basically what happened that led up to that is that I got stuck in this negative place in my head Then I kind of just retreated from life into my room and stopped eating or bathing and I just waited to die And there was one point where I hated myself so much that I masturbated and came all over my body then I just lay there Well the first one is like cyber sex or something, but the second one that's like Torture Yeah, so I don't think those should count they don't count. Right, so then yes, I don't masturbate. She turned to face me more directly again, inspecting my face. This time, I looked back and smiled. Why are you telling me all this stuff? Because I trust you, and because somehow I know that you'll understand where I'm coming from, even if you've never experienced these exact things. Am I wrong? I don't know. She put her head back against her headdress and let out an exasperated breath. I'm complicated. I know, so am I. She looked back at me with a serious expression on her face. So you know about my drinking, right? Well, sort of. I've heard things here and there, but I don't know many specifics, and I don't, I don't know how much of what I've heard is true. Well, I'll just tell you. Everyone thinks my drinking got really bad last semester because that's all they know. But I've been drinking since I was like 13 or 14. I started off with just sneaking as much cooking wine as I could get, but when I stopped feeling anything from that, I moved up to whatever harder liquor I could get out of my parents' cabinet. Everyone thought I was really quiet in high school, but that's usually because I'd have a bottle of water mixed with alcohol that I'd drink from throughout the day, so I wouldn't have to feel as much. I looked back at her, but didn't really know how to respond. I don't know much about addiction or what it feels like. I have some cousins that are hard into hard drugs, but I never got to know them very well. But I know what it's like to do things just so you don't have to think or feel about anything else. I've done that before with video games. Not that I'm trying to equate our experiences, I'm just saying I can sort of start to see the feelings that would take you there, at least a little bit. It's okay, I just wanted to tell you about me since you told me something about you. We both sat in silent reflection. We're too messed up to do this, right? She asked. What do, what do you mean? She let out a long, drawn-out sigh. I looked at her, and she looked back. I can't say it with you looking at me. Okay, I'll look out the window. I can still see your reflection in the side view mirror. <laughs> Pull your hat down over your face and close your eyes. She did. I closed my eyes out of courtesy and waited, my heart croaking in the bottom of my throat. I think I have feelings for you, too. I kept my eyes closed, but my eyebrows raised as high as they possibly could, and I felt a smile spread across my face. I continued waiting as I listened to the drumming of the blood circulating. I continued waiting as I listened to the drumming of the blood circulating in each side of my head. What do you think about that? Can I open my eyes now? <laughs> yes. 
I opened my eyes and looked back at her. She was out from under her hat, but was curled up halfway into a ball on the corner of her seat with her back against the driver's side door. How long have you felt that way? Uh, she looked up to the ceiling as if she were counting back in her head. Do you remember when we first texted outside of Tinder? Yeah. Since then, after that weekend. I smiled uncontrollably for a moment and thought of another question. Wait, so when you told me your drinking got really bad last week, did that have anything to do with me because I stopped texting you? She looked back at me and I could already see the answer on her face. I don't know, I was really drunk, I can't remember much. I mean, I guess. We sat quietly for a minute before she burst out into something between a pout and nervous laughter. <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, what do you mean? I don't want to be hindrance on your mental health or stability, and I don't think either of us is in a good place to try to start a relationship. Well, trying to do without you is already a huge strain on my mental health, and we don't have to do anything more than be friends like we've already been doing. I'm happy just as long as I get to have you in my life. She looked back at me with a sense of wonder as if what I had just suggested was an entirely new idea to her. And you'd be okay with that? Why not, as long as you are? She kept looking at me and nodded her head once in agreement. Can I ask you something else? I asked. Yeah. If you've had feelings for me since all the way back then, then why'd you text me about your date with Monty? She looked at me somewhat sheepishly. <laughs> Sorry, I guess I just wanted to see how you'd react. I smiled and passed the tip of my tongue along the corner of my mouth. Oh, so you were trying to make me jealous, huh? She laughed nervously. No, it's not like that. I, I smiled and shook my head at her with my left eye closed to let her know that I was just teasing. The dash display was stopped on track one. It had already played the entire album through to the end. The digital clock showed past <coughs> 11. Anyway, I should go up to the apartment. You'd probably better get back before your mom starts to wonder if we're having sex or something. Thanks for the invitation and the talk. She laughed and nodded her head in agreement. I got out of the passenger side and walked up toward the curb of my apartment building, then turned around and made a motion for her to roll down the window. Text me when you get home, all right? We said goodnight and I watched her as she drove away before proceeding up to my apartment. Put my coat up, got out of my day clothes and into my pajamas and listened to Feel by the Animals on repeat while I waited for her text and my download of Trouble Will Find Me. or videos, tag Timiqua Arts, tag a location, tag Authentic Cells. My Instagram is the underscore poetic engineer, and I will post all the pictures and, well, not all of them, but I'll post pictures and videos of you, and remember the show is the third Sunday of every month. Next month, uh, for December, to end up the year, we'll be doing all open mic. So, I'll be able to get more of you. Please sign up, bring your friends, and thank you so much for being here tonight, and, and there's cake. <laughs> okay, so our last few, um, Felicia, a.k.a. Phoenix, and please line up over here so we can um, move along. Uh, then Melissa, then Ian, then Cedric, then Emmett, and finally Branye. Start with 
um, original song about my relationship with my Heavenly Father, and I wrote this after I got to know him. So in this interest of time, I'm gonna start, and it's called Already Known Me. <clears throat> Remember when I'd sit and wonder, I looked at you, little I knew, that all my life you'd already known me. Remember when I'd sit and wonder, ask you this and ask you that, and still you had all the patience with me. Life is good and bittersweet, you told me. Enemies can be friends. Now the world is dying down all around. I know us till the end. Just looking back at all the mistakes I made. But still you stayed, you carried me, and you supported me. Lessons abound, still sit and wonder. Ask you this, and ask you that. And still you have all the patience with me. Love is good and bittersweet. You told me enemies can be friends. Now the world is dying down all around. But I've known us till the with that unconditional love and so when I realized that that inspired me to write that song and my last piece is about um, a common theme and I do want to just say thank you so much for ha us allowing us to have this open space but depression a darkness that you feel like you can't escape and it's so important to have those outlets and that support so this is something um, it doesn't have a title, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to read. I wonder why I continue to feel this way. I feel empty. I feel alone. I feel sorry. Hope is a void that doesn't exist in this moment. I have no voice. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry. I get quiet. I gather strength. I don't let negative thoughts weigh me down. I don't let me weigh me down. I don't 
get weighed down, I escape mm -hmm. from my pit. Thank you so much. Thank you for following me. I'm on Instagram at the Phoenix Live. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you to the Tamikwa Art Center. And thank you for all the acts tonight. Thank you. I'm Phoenix. closing the door, finally, on a toxic past. As I rebuild anew, I look back and I don't see you. My heart soars knowing I'm free. I was tested and had to learn new skills. I rebuilt and learned a new stride. As I walk through new doors, I hold my head high. I have found a new confidence. My heart soars with all the new paths I can take. I was broken and lost. Now I'm learning who I am. I am proud of who I'm becoming. I am finally free. I am finally me. Moving right along. This uh, is from my uh, tarot cycle. This is called the Two of Wands. Okay, for this story, I'm gonna to need to take you all somewhere, so I need you to close your eyes and take a deep breath. And as you exhale that breath, you're going to hear faint music filling the air and getting louder. It is a calliope, and it is playing a familiar tune. Do, 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 do. Now I need you all to take one more breath, and on this breath, you're going to notice the whiff of popcorn and sweat. And now go ahead and open your eyes, and we are there, we're in the circus, everybody. It's one of those old Victorian big tops with a canvas tent of black and white stripes. Huge thing. You are sitting on uncomfortable hardwood bleachers that were built today by a, a group of itinerant workers with no insurance, but that's just part of the excitement. <laughs> There's danger everywhere in the circus. In that ring, there are clowns beating each other with every kind of oversized implement. And in that ring, we have a demonstration of electricity on a woman's hair. And here in the center ring, we have the powerful and fearsome Carl. This is a really progressive circus. They, they don't have animals. They just have one really big guy. He, he's not even like that big a guy. He's just sort of big in spirit. Oh, you should see it when they get the fearless Carl Taylor in there. But that's not happening now. Now everything's being ushered off. And the ringmaster has come to the center and has directed your attention to that side of the tent where you see a very tall pole. And up at the top of that pole, there is a platform, and extending from that platform, there is a rope. And the rope pulls across, and it goes all the way to another platform. And at that platform, we see our heroine, Wanda. Oh, she's still climbing. I'm sorry, it's a very tall pole. She's getting up there, but she's almost there. All right, there she is, Wanda. Wanda stands atop the platform. She is by far the brightest star in this entire tent. She shines like a jewel atop a crown. Every facet of her costume catches the light from the spotlight. It's one of those uh, candle lights behind a, a big piece of glass, so it's just waving off of her and it shimmers out into the sides. And Wanda stands poised and ready to take her first step. And as she lifts her foot and goes to set it on the rope, she is thinking to herself, I don't think I'm sparkly enough. I think that's the problem. <laughs> See, Wanda used to come to this very circus back when she was a child. She and her friends would sneak under the tent and they'd hide under the bleachers and hold pieces of old newspaper and try and catch popcorn as it fell down. And then, they would climb up to the top of the rafters and they would watch the show through people's butts and eat the popcorn. 
She liked the clowns, they were funny, and she was always thrilled by a Carl de demonstration. <laughs> but what she came for was the acrobat, because the acrobat was the shiniest thing she had ever seen in her entire life. The acrobat was just a, a shimmering gem of a thing, and she wanted nothing more than to be the gem up there when she was down in the bleachers and, and just watching the show. And so, eventually, she ran away from home and joined the circus. Now, at the time, this was a much more uh, a reasonable career option for people to take. <laughs> But of course, when she got there, she knew nothing about being an acrobat. She knew nothing about doing any sort of daredevil work. So she had to originally just take work helping out around the circus, you know? Picking things up and moving them, helping set up the tent, cleaning up after Carl. The stuff that you have to do <laughs> when you work at the circus. But every second that she could find to herself, Wanda would walk across a rope. She started by laying the rope on the ground and walking across it like that. And then she got some bricks, lifted it up off the ground, walked across it a foot up, then two feet up, then three. All she did was walk across ropes. She did this so much that eventually she could only walk in a straight line. They could only give her tasks that could be completed <laughs> linearly. Wanda, take this rope over there. That was it. Wanda could barely talk to anyone. She was always moving in a straight line anywhere that she went. She could do it in her sleep. She had. She had fallen asleep on the platform and gotten all the way to the other platform before she knew it. Wanda could do this infinitely. Wanda had no problem with the rope. Her problem was with her costume. See, she started with a unitard, and she put sequins of a W on the unitard, and well, it just didn't quite fit, so she covered the rest in pink sequins. But it wasn't enough. It couldn't reach out to the, the far dark corners of the tent. And so she added leggings and sleeves to it. And then she decided that she needed it to go higher, and so she put on this headdress with long peacock feathers, each topped with a jewel, and then finally, her coup de gras, a glittering cape of sequins that she would unfurl at the top and the entire crowd would always gasp. I noticed you all just sat there. That's fine. <laughs> Normally they gasp. <laughs> but of course, adding all of this to her costume changed her balance. And as Wanda looked at the rope, and lifted her leg and went to set her foot down. She did very safely, because she's a fucking professional. You think it's the first time she tried walking this rope in a costume? My God, did I not tell you she could do this in her sleep when you're not paying attention? There was never any danger of her not getting across the rope. That was not where the danger came from. The breath is held until she gets to the other side, climbs down the platform, and after the show, walks up to the ringmaster and asks for a month off. <laughs> when we begin any passion, it is easy to get caught on a single track. But the rest of our life does not simply fall away. We are both the acrobat on the platform and the child in the stands. And we need to make room in our lives for both. Thank you. I want to tell y'all what happened to me. I was in a club one night when I saw the light. A gorgeous woman with a dynamic ass that was just right. 
<laughs> For me, as they played the sexy beat, she began to swell by the so erotically. I wanted to buy and kiss her feet. She was perfect, she didn't have a flaw. Untouchable, she was above the law. As I watched, I began to fantasize about her and I, this is what I saw. Curves so smooth, skin and deep, chocolate hue. Body so soft, I want badly to caress you. In my arms, feel your entire body warm. My flesh, my soul, that poke is not a gun. Don't be alone. We slow down chest to chest. I can feel your heart pound. My hands can't stay still at your waist, then they slowly move down. You feel so great, I put you on my plate and my food till you come. I can see and feel you elevate. How do you like that? Let me lick you back. I continue to go down. Now you feel where I'm at? The rain is pouring now, going so deep. Rain storm for the next hour, lead trumpet is what I see. Now you lay next to me, oh how you bless me. Snake tell me you made my copa dance, help me since you put me in the trance. You erotic, exotic, oh my God, it's incredible. It's so sexy. Then we lay in the bed and I told her I want to ride too. And she said, hell yeah. <laughs> I said, cool, let's go. I enter your paradise and French kiss you click. The more she cries and screams, the faster I lick. Love leg shaking again, I love that sight. You've never had pleasure like you have in the night. My mouth is shining like I've been playing the grease. I'm working clitoris, this is my ultimate feast. I love you, I love your rain, I watch you do your thing. How you throw it back and get mesmerized. Wait, what's my name? You don't throw my track, bouncing forward and back. Wait, where am I at? Tonight I'll make you mine, it's amazing one of a kind. Your brain is the bum, it's ahead of its time. I did, I did this a hundred times, man. I, I, mm. You got it. I might need to start up. I forgot this shit. Huh? Another one real quick, it's like two minutes. Um, it's called The Journey of Love. As I wrote it, I cried, tears of joy, tears of times I wonder why. Why, what did I do wrong? This poem is about love, one we hope comes from above. But no matter what we do and say, sometimes it's just not the way. I speak of the journey, the roller coaster love can take you through. The ups and downs, smiles and frowns, the craziest things love can make us do. It twists and turns when love is cold and when it burns. What a ride. I hate you with three. I can't breathe without you. I need you by my side. I can't wait to see my baby. How can I help the world today? How's some food I bought? Fuck the world. I hate everyone. Don't ask me for shit. It's tremendous how love can affect our thoughts. Your beautiful heart can feel warm like everything is in place. Then it can hurt, feel low than dirt. Sweetness now has a bitter taste. I think of you all day. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see you and say, I love you, I'll squeeze you. Find the bed so we can lay. Going to the park, feeling safe in the dark. Quality time. I love it. Going to shows, watching our love float. I've never seen your kind. I feel like you complete me. There's no other place I'd rather be. I want more, I'm thirsty. I've been waiting a while for someone to make you smile. Now that I have it, I'm scared. I'm at your mercy. I hate to send them roller coasters. When a roller coaster rides through a peak, it usually falls really fast. This love is at that peak. Still with the heavens is what I see. I hope we don't crash. Love is possible to be a fallen tree. Tim Burr. I love you with all my strength, but I can't get over your temper. You leave me. I told you that you complete me. But it's my fault where I am. I knew better. I said I never put my heart in another's hands. No love can really hurt your face. It's a marathon, not a race. After traveling hundreds of miles and much returns, you can still end up in the same place. But all in all, love is wonderful. It's amazing when it comes from above. 
But when it's mistaken, it can be dreadful, malignant. It's the journey of love. Thank you. I've been going through a lot of personal growth lately, and uh, this is contributing to that. Uh, these are from a darker point in my life. This is courage. Cold sweat. Almost a shiver runs through me. My mind is racing. Mid panic, a thought crosses and ricochets between my ears. I hear. Where is your courage now? Is this what courage is? Do I have a choice? Even though inside I'm shaking, my body moves slowly and in a matter of fact motion, my hand rests upon cold metallic insecurities while brushing aside memories and red flags. My finger touches the five pounds it takes to tip the scale. One deep breath, then nothing. Just the mechanical click of failure ringing in my ear. I think about trying again and quickly weigh my options, but the five pounds has turned to a hundred, and to action another opportunity seems impossible to accomplish. I couldn't bear another failure in such rapid succession. I wonder who named this the easy way out, and why is it so difficult? I suddenly remember the substances I tend to swim in, attempting to drown these insecurities, so for now, I'll tuck them back under my bed and I'll come back the next time that I build up the courage. Mm -hmm. uh, this is peace. I watch, sorry. I was traveling over urban hills and valleys lost in my own thoughts. I watch the sun melt into the horizon. The sky begins to bleed. Behind me, the clouds age gray. Shadows creep over the water and my reflection fades. All I can see is swallowed whole. Angels dance overhead like vultures, banging drums and singing songs as I hold my breath. My thoughts are empty. My will is weak. The water invites me in with a strange yet comforting hospitality, and I accept. I perceive the growing pressure as the chill seeps through my flesh, my bones, my being. Why do I feel so cold, and why does this feel like home? I'd rather not swim. I'm caught between e easing into the growing weight of what's above me and the pitch black uncertainty of what's beneath. Visions swirl in the deep. Holograms of memories and fairy tales surround me. Daydreams flicker in the darkness. They slowly fade and dim until finally peace. <laughs> Peace, beautiful people. Peace. Nah, that's weak. That's weak. Let's try it again. <laughs> Too much energy in the room on Sunday night. I said, peace, beautiful peace. people. Peace. That's what's up. Yes, yes. My name is Ronye Hawkins, a.k.a. Paint With Words, right in Orlando, Florida. Uh, it's my first time here at Timaqua. <laughs> We wanted to get on here for a minute now, so now, thank you, Miss Lauren. Greatly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Ty, I see you. Yeah. What's good, brother? D, thank you so much for your support as well. Thank you for coming. Um, so, let me set up real quick. So this first piece is pretty much about part of my testimony. I went through 10 years of depression and silence. Some people call it a functioning depressant. So on my healing journey from 2016 to right now, which accumulates seven years, 
for that purpose, it made me become a mindset coach, a life coach for creatives, because we need it. Okay, it's very important. You know, everybody talks about the marketing side of the creative within the industry, but nobody talks about their mindset and their spirit and their heart. It's very important. So you got to have it all in divine alignment. So, so I took, put together this collection of poetry that's centered around mental health. So this first one we'll do is called Note to Self, okay? It goes like this. People pleasing will kill you. You know it's true. But you stop paying attention to the signs right in front of you. You want to let go but still crave for control. Hands on the steering wheel while pride feasting at your soul. Overlooking conviction. Struggling with addiction, God's love is a remedy, but you delay its prescription. Let go of your idols, or your healing will become stifled. Seek to love yourself is the best form of health. Desperate for validation will detour its mission. Demons of your past will blur your vision. Time to pray, fast, and slay. Break free from those chains. You are not defined by your mistakes. I'm going to say that again. You are not defined by your mistakes. So forgive yourself and walk away. Thank you. All right. So my second piece was for a friend of mine for her birthday. It's called my birthday card. So I'm going to set up real quick and we're going to go into it. So y'all know how you do when you walk inside of Hallmark, right? So. No disrespect to my Caucasian counterparts, but <laughs> the section in the back, they got mahogany. Why is it that? Now I gotta walk through there all the way to the back. They got a small little section. Now I gotta go look for some cards, try to find the right words, and guess what? I still didn't get it. <laughs> so, light bulb came on. I was like, wait a minute, Ryan, you're a writer. <laughs> That's right. I write this myself. So, it goes like this. If I had to look up the word love in the dictionary, your face would be right next to it. Before God broke the mold, he put in extra time so that no one would look like you, sound like you, personality to last for years as you. Still human, but have the ability to walk with angels. You shed a few tears. Your self-esteem has been mangled. Only to come to the realization of conquering your fears. You tasted hell in bittersweet pieces. Now to the mountaintop you go. So enjoy the view to capture that mental thesis. Let the sun kiss your soul. Destiny is in her left hand while perseverance is in her right. Grab a hold to the steering wheel of life. Time to take control. Time to take flight. Dance within the puddles of your teardrops and celebrate. Bask in this moment and don't ever ever stop. While you wait to exchange a crown of thorns for a crown of stars, continue to shoot for the moon. Love will carry you there. And laughter, yeah, laughter is medicine for the heart. Peace. Here to get better, everybody. Woo!